Hey, we're reading through God's Word in the Anchored in the Word series. If you have a Bible, you want to open in your Bible to Acts chapter 4 as we look at our message, Explosive Boldness. Now, if you forgot a Bible, just raise your hand. Our service team will get you a Bible. In a few moments, we're going to stand and read the first 12 verses of chapter 4. But when we think of explosive boldness, last week I shared with you about explosive power that the Holy Spirit was poured out upon people to be the instruments for His glory. Now, explosive boldness is the same, and the word explosive may seem a little more destructive if you separate it from the context. When explosions are confined to energize with a purpose, they are very, very productive to propel us through life. This week, unless you've converted to electric cars, if you have an old school combustion engine like I do, you can have four cylinders, six cylinders, eight cylinders, whatever it might be, but there's this combustion, this explosion that's going on in every one of those cylinders to propel you all around the community. And that's what the Spirit of God wants to do, is give us explosive boldness to be able to be a mouthpiece for the Lord. And I don't know about you, but when the Lord asked me to stand up to a group of people or even to share with an individual, even to this day, I've been walking with the Lord for all these years, almost 40 years, and I still get that fearful butterfly inside of me when I'm going to share with someone. You're like, oh, you're a pre-. I would rather share with a thousand people than the Lord nudge me with the person on the airplane next to me, right? Because in that confine, do you know that you're getting all the seats in front of you, all the seats behind you, and the seats over here? I was on a flight. I was going to, uh, flying to do some ministry in Africa, and I was next to a, a professional soccer player from Canada who had just retired. He was going for a, uh, a appearance as a professional athlete to his home of Ethiopia, and he was Muslim, and the Lord nudges me to share with him. Now, I don't know about you, but I have these conversations with the Lord in my head, especially when I travel. It's usually something like this, Lord, not today. I'm so tired. I got up early. You know, I didn't get a good night of sleep. I just feel like I'm all wrung out. I'm like a wet rag. And I'm just like, you know, and I just like, I whine like a little baby. And, and I go, okay. And I said, okay, give me boldness, Lord. Give me courage. Help me speak. Because I want you to know, without the Spirit of God, I am a stinking coward. You ever feel cowardly? You ever feel like, here's this opportunity, and you're like, I'm not saying nothing. Because you don't, want to be, you don't want to be rejected. It's all about being rejected, right? With your family, with a coworker, with a best friend. To share the truth of God's word, you know, can be very divisive. Because an ungodly world does not want to hear the truth of God. Because it's a bright light that sh- shines in the darkness of their sinful hearts. And it makes them mad. And so God's word does that. So I was sharing with this guy, and we started, he was, and he was Muslim. And so he began to be very angry and animated on the plane. Now, it can go sideways really quick on an airplane, right? Especially if you're having a dialogue with uh, Islam on an airplane. And so I'm talking, and I start whispering into him. I said, hey, we can talk about these things about Jesus in a low voice. Because I'm thinking, I told him, I said, dude, we're going to be arrested. We're going to be kicked off the plane unless you calm down. He's like, he was so angry at the message of Jesus because the, the Muslims believe Jesus is a prophet but not the son of God or the savior of the world. So anyway, these are the kind of things that I'm always trying to talk the Lord out of, right? I was like, hey, I don't want to do this. And the Lord's like, no, I want you to do it. Sometimes it goes great. Sometimes it goes Well, it's still great because the Lord prompted me to do it, but they are not very receptive. Sometimes you're sowing a seed. Sometimes you're watering a seed. Sometimes you get to harvest that plant that's been growing up. But the reality is, is that I want you to know, for me, when I'm struggling, I pray for boldness, and it's not until I open my mouth with the first sentence that I feel the boldness flow. It's like faith is like a gateway to the power of God. I ask for the faith. I ask for the power, and then I must take a step. As long as I'm waiting for power without opening my mouth, I never do it. So I have to pray, and then as soon as I get the first sentence out, I'm like, I'm good to go. (laughs) Right? Let's talk. And so when we look at this story in Acts chapter 4, it's a lesson. It's a blueprint. It's a way for us to understand that the cowardliness of us If we ask by faith for the boldness of God by his spirit, he will fill us and he will use us. 
And the weakest among us can be the mightiest of giants. I've always thought, do you know in the book of uh, Judges about the story of Samson? It says, and the Spirit of God came upon Samson. And then he just became, I mean, he was, he, he tore a lion apart. I mean, he like was ferocious. But I've always thought it would be so funny to see the video reel in heaven that Samson, because in Sunday school curriculum, Samson's always, he looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger when he was Mr. Universe. I've always thought it was funny. If he could be like Pee Wee Herman, and then the Spirit of God comes on him, and he's this fierce warrior, but he's Mr. the 99-pound weakling, because it's not about our strength. It's about his. And so when you realize that, check this out. Stand with me. Let's read this, and let's get some courage from the Spirit of God. Acts chapter 4, explosive boldness. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Father, we ask now that you would open our eyes that we would see wonderful things from your word. Open our hearts, open our understanding. Lord, fill us with your spirit. Fill us as a congregation with boldness to be a voice in this dark, godless world with the love of Jesus. And we ask it in your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The first thing we see is the opportunity for boldness that was in chapter 3. And just a brief recap, there was a lame guy that was begging money outside of the temple. And Peter and John were going into the temple, and he was begging for alms. Peter said, silver or gold, have I not? But what I have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ, rise and walk. And he grabbed him by the hand, and he stood him up. Now we find at the end of this story in chapter 4 that this man has been lame from birth and he's over 40 years of age. If you've ever seen somebody that's lame in their legs and they're in a wheelchair or whatever, there's, there's just bone and skin because it's, it's so atrophied. There's no muscle. And this supernatural miracle, as he takes his hand and he stands him up, that means the healing of his muscles, his ligaments, his tendons, everything to be strong enough to stand. It says he was walking and leaping and praising God. Now it's tough to do that when you've never walked in your entire life. Think about this. You learn to walk, right, as a toddler. He's never learned to walk. None of these things. And it's a supernatural miracle. Now everybody saw it. They recognized the man. Then they looked in Peter and John. And Peter took the opportunity to preach a powerful message, and about 5,000 people believed. Whether it was adding 2,000 to the 3,000 that was already saved uh, from Acts chapter 2, we're not sure. Either way, it's a megachurch, from 3,000 to 5,000, or if it's 3,000 plus 5,000, that's 8,000. There is a supernatural work going through God's spirit and boldness and signs and wonders. People being healed. Supernatural things are happening, which gives you the platform for the boldness. When God answers prayer, when God does something cool in your life, then that's a platform when people go, that's amazing, and they want to give the credit to someone else. It's a great opportunity for you to say, no, this is what Jesus has done, and you tell them about Jesus. And that's what Peter's going to do here. Now, the religious leaders are so torqued off, they'll say in chapter 5, the next chapter, that you guys have filled Jerusalem with this doctrine of Jesus' resurrection. They thought they were insulting them. Isn't that a great compliment? Can you imagine somebody coming to us, the mayor of the city, the city council, going, you guys got to shut up about Jesus. The entire county's talking about Jesus. You're like, thank you very much. That's the goal. 
right? We want everybody to know about Jesus. We want everybody to know about his love, his forgiveness, eternity with him. That's the plan, to go out into all the world and to preach the gospel, making disciples of everybody. That's our commission. So now this incredible group of people, the most intimidating religious group of people from the high priest, all of his family, all of the, uh, the Sanhedrin, which is 70 elders of Israel and plus one, so are there 71 plus the one is the high priest, and they have to now give an answer to what's just taken place. Imagine you're called on the carpet in that moment. Even right now, if I just picked you up out of the crowd, I go, you, come up here and now share your faith for the next 20 minutes. Tell us your story. You can see people just starting to shrink down on their chair, saying, I didn't sign up for that. No, thank you. We're told that that is people's greatest fear. Well, I think there's greater fears, right? But it's one that makes people uncomfortable to have to speak. So how much more do you need the Spirit of God to fill you with courage and boldness to speak since it's a very intimidating thing? Now, it's intimidating when it's one-on-one -on -one to a stranger. How about the most august, if you will, or renowned religious body of leadership in the entire nation of Israel in Jerusalem, and you've got to go give them a Bible study? That's a little intimidating. But that's what this thing looks like. Notice it in this source of boldness that we discover in verse 5. It came to pass on the next day that their rulers and elders and scribes, as well as Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander, and as many were the, of the family of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem, and they asked them this vital question. You see, this religious group of people are the keepers of the kingdom, and if somebody begins to teach about a rabbi or teach a doctrine, according to Deuteronomy 13, it's their responsibility to evaluate that teaching. So that's what they ask at the end of verse 7. By what power or by what name have you done this? What took place was a man that was over 40 years of age, been lame his whole life. Peter and John healed him. So they want to know by what power or by what name this took place. Now, Peter takes this opportunity for the boldness to be filled with God's Spirit and to speak clearly. Now, this is the key. Every Christian needs to discover two verses as bookends to your life. The first one is, Jesus says in John 15, Apart from me, you can do nothing. What part of nothing don't you get? Like, nothing's fruitful. It doesn't mean you can't get up and go to work. It doesn't mean you can't live life, you know, paying the bills, eating, sleeping. Nothing fruitful for God's kingdom. You can't do anything fruitful for God's kingdom apart from Jesus. But he says, if you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit, and that brings my Father glory. So first I have to realize, apart from Jesus, I cannot be fruitful in the kingdom of God. But then the other is, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So that fills me with boldness. On the one hand, I'm dead in the water without the power of God. On the other hand, I can do anything that God calls me to do with God's power. What that does is that it removes the pride or the arrogance that when God uses you, you think it's you. Because you knew in the beginning, I can't pull this off. And then God comes through and you're like, praise Jesus. Because otherwise, I was, I, was, I was toast. And that keeps you humble. Now, the danger is, is that we beg for God's help, then he helps us, and then we steal the glory. We're like, yeah, I knew, I just, I was prepared. You know, I just came ready. No, you didn't. You're not ready. You don't have what it takes to change people's lives. Yet when God fills us with his spirit. Now, Jesus told the disciples, when you get called on the carpet by judges and governors, and you're called into the courtroom, he said, don't prepare your message. Don't. Write down notes. Oh, I'm going to tell him this. He says, when you go, you go totally by faith, and the Spirit's going to give you exactly what you need to tell that group of people. Now, some pe preachers take that, that that's supposed to happen in the pulpit. No, you're supposed to study and show yourself approved. If you're a preacher, you don't just get up and open the Bible and start going for it. But in a case where you're thrown in jail, you're going to go before these leaders. You need God's help. So it says in verse 8, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well? Can you imagine being thrown in jail for healing a guy? What was your crime? We healed a lame man. Say what? You're going to do some jail time for healing a lame guy? Isn't that a good deed? Isn't that a good thing? 
No, it was the message that followed the healing that they had a beef with, they had a problem with. So he tells them in verse 8, or excuse me, verse 10, Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. And this is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This exclusive statement in verse 12 is the most offensive a statement to a pluralistic, godless society. If you say this verse or John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. Do you realize how exclusive that claim is? Well, what about the Hindus? What about the Buddhists? What about the Muslims? What about the, you know, Harry Krishna Rama Rama at the airport? What do you... What, what about all these other religions? You Christians are so arrogant, bigoted, prejudiced because you claim that your Jesus is the only way. Now, first of all, let's keep the record straight. I never claimed or wrote in the Bible that Jesus is the only way. He did. So I want you to know I'm just delivering a very accurate book report. That's the preacher's job is to bring a good book report. I've read the book. This is what the book says. This is what the Savior says. He says he's the only way to get there. And so, as I shared with you last week, he's either a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord. It's your choice. And the reality is that we believe that he's Lord because nobody of any of those other religions has ever died for my sins and rose from the dead. Jesus is in a club all by himself. Nobody else has raised from the dead. When people ask me about Buddhism or Hinduism, I simply ask them, have they risen from the dead? No. Now, they believe in uh, reincarnation and various things, and it doesn't mean there's not moral teaching in all of those different religions. Sometimes a moral teaching sounds just like this Bible verse. It doesn't mean that uh, some of their, their, their truths aren't close to biblical things. The reality is, is that Jesus is the only way, and Peter stamps this with a sledgehammer when he says that there is no other name under heaven given among men by which you must be saved. Somebody was sharing with me yesterday, and I will have to do the research to check this out, but in Great Britain, you cannot do a broadcast that declares what I just declared, that Jesus is the only way to heaven, because you'll be fined in Great Britain. So now they're doing broadcasting offshore, 50 miles away from Great Britain, to broadcast it into the country, because otherwise you're going to be fined or arrested, whatever it is. Do you know in Canada, they've kicked out focus on the family out of the, state, out of the country of Canada, and so now people are having to broadcast it from the America side into Canada because a totalitarian government wants to be the supreme authority in any ministry that says Jesus is the only way or any ministry that says God is the supreme authority, they've got to stop that narrative. They've got to shut that down. And we have had that freedom in America, but that freedom is eroding. That freedom is going away. Everybody around the world has escaped their countries to come to America to experience what liberty and freedom's like. But where will you and I escape to when it's gone here? So unless we stand up, we are going to declare this message. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. I didn't declare that. I am now echoing what he said, and I believe it to be true. He is the only way. People said, no, there's many roads to God. I agree with you. There's many roads to God. There's not many roads to heaven, but all roads lead to God. Because people are going to stand before the great white throne judgment of God, and then spend an eternity separated from God in hell, or you're going to end up on the road that is the reward seat, the bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ, where you receive rewards or lose rewards as a Christian. This is biblical New Testament doctrine. So this reality, all roads, I, I agree with people. Hey, man, all roads lead to God. Not all roads lead to heaven. This society that has cast aside Judeo-Christian ethics to embrace academic postmodernism, that you can believe anything, you can be any, it's like moving into fantasy land. You know, you can be a different gender if you want to be. You could be a fluid gender if you want to be. 
there's all this, like, there's this removal from reality, but the definition of truth is reality. The more you're anchored in truth, the more you understand reality, and the more you reject truth. It's very much like Paul told the Romans. He said, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They are educated (laughs) with lots of, uh, you know, PhD and various degrees behind their name, and they've rejected the Lord. Years ago, and this was 30 years ago, my pastor, Pastor Chuck Smith, was on a radio interview with the head of religion of USC and another pastor. And the head of the religion of USC said, well, we know that there were three, uh, three uh, Isaiahs, and it was a, you know, a controversy thing. And, and <laughs> Pastor Chuck said, well, Jesus quoted from all three sections, you're saying were three different Isaiahs, and he attributed it to one Isaiah. And the, the, the uh, professor of religion from USC said, well, we know more than Jesus does today than what he knew. And, and Pastor Chuck, this is a radio interview across all Southern California. He said, are you telling me, as a professor of religion, you know more than Jesus? And he said, well, of course, everybody knows that. And Pastor Chuck hung up. And, and the... Uh, the <laughs> The producer of the show called back and he says, oh, I'm sorry, Pastor Chuck, it seems like, uh, you know, we had a disconnect. He said, yep, we're going to have another one too. And he hugged back up. He said, how in the world can I have an interview with a guy that thinks he's smarter than Jesus, the Lord of glory? Professing themselves to be wise, they become absolute fools. Peter's words that there is no other name under heaven by which you must be saved. It's a radical statement. And you have to do something with it. Either the name of Jesus has saved you, it can save you, but if you reject it, you're free to choose your own path. This is the radical thing, though, is all of us are free to choose, make our choice, but we are not free with the results that that choice brings. That's in God's camp. You can choose whatever you want to believe, You cannot choose the consequences of what you have chosen. Never forget that. Every choice has the consequence. And this reality is now being brought home to a very religious group of people that are so blown away by Peter's boldness. Look what it says in verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. They have exhibit A, super bold, backwater fisherman, hillbilly from Galilee with a funny accent, filled with the Spirit of God, and boldly proclaiming Jesus. And they also have the healed man. So they have exhibit A, exhibit B, and they go, wow, this guy's been hanging out with Jesus because we just had this conversation with Jesus two months ago, right? And it's the same, or three months ago. And he had the same kind of boldness because when we spend time with the Lord and he fills us with his Spirit, people are going to know, hey, you've been hanging out with Jesus with that kind of boldness. It was a reflection of the intimate relationship Peter and John had with Jesus, and it also was evident that a supernatural thing had taken place. Now, if I have exhibit A, something supernatural is being declared to me, and also exhibit B, a healed man that has been lame since he is 40 years of age, never seen anything like that in my entire life, I think I would pause and say, let's think about this. Maybe Jesus is real, and his power is real. I mean, it's worth a discussion, right? No, because if your heart has already decided no, there's nowhere to go. You've chosen to reject the bold message you just heard. People do that all the time. You know, some people come to church because they want to know things, and other people come to church because they've already decided things, and they sit there and they glare at you through the whole thing. And they'll tell me afterwards. I have very interesting conversations at the door of church. You guys have no idea. I heard about you guys. I come here just to blow you out of the water. You guys don't know what you're talking about. And I look at them and say, why'd you come to church? I just wanted to prove you wrong. So you didn't prove anything wrong, but it's interesting to me. Why would I get up and take a shower and come to church just to reject God? I think deep down inside, they know they're wrong, and they're looking for somebody to prove that God is real. They're desperate. And I've had people tell me these 
fascinating things. I had this girl tell me, she says, I'm a meth addict, and uh, I'm clean, I'm, you know, right now I'm not high, and I love to come to the church because it gives me peace when I come, but I don't re- want to receive Jesus. So I'm having this conversation with her, you know. And I'm like, so I said, this is fascinating to me. I said, why do you want to be here with us? She's like, well, there's this incredible peace here, and I love this peace, and it's the only place I experience this peace, and when I leave here, I don't have this peace, but I don't want Jesus' peace. And I told her, I said, well, if you have Jesus, then you have his peace wherever you go. I know I don't want that. She said, I really don't understand it. I said, that's not true. I said, you understand it totally. You just don't want to change. She sheepishly smiled. She said, you're right. She said, I know if I surrender my life to Jesus, I have to stop doing math. And I don't want to stop doing math. And I said, well, there you go. Math or Jesus. Jesus and peace. Math and your high. It's your choice. She left. And she would just visit every three or four months, tasting of the peace, knowing Jesus was the answer, but wouldn't let go of her math. It's fascinating, isn't it? Where people are at. I appreciate her, her honesty, though, because most people just lie to you as a preacher. Right? As soon as they find out you're a preacher, they start blowing smoke. I mean, they're telling all kinds of big whoppers. I'd rather people be honest. I walked up to a guy I know. I had seen him at church, and I was walking up to him, and he was smoking a cigarette. And I walked up to him, and he was so freaked out that he thought I would be troubled by the cigarette, which I was not. He stuck it in his pocket. And I thought to myself, this is going to be the most fascinating conversation. So I walked up to him, and uh, I just wanted to stay there and see how long he could handle that. that. So what's going on? He's like, no, nothing, Pastor. He's kind of trying to blow me off. And I'm like, no, tell me about your week. You know? <laughs> I can be just a bit mischievous sometimes, poor guy. Anyway, look at the rejecting of the bold message. In verse 15, but when they had commanded them to go outside of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, what shall we do with these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it, but so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. (laughs) That's a nice way of saying, no, we're not going to do that. For we cannot but speak the things which God, uh, which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man who was, uh, man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. So isn't this exciting? This is mind-blowing to me that these guys, they, they confer, hey, there's an obvious miracle. They don't talk about we should believe. <laughs> they just say, how do we shut this thing down? Well, let's just threaten them. Just tell them to shut up. Now, when somebody individually shares, when I've been sharing my faith with someone, say it's a coworker or a family member, and they look at me and they say, hey, Rick, I know you're a Christian. I know you've, you've been sharing with me, but I don't want to hear it anymore. When they share that with me, I honor that. Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before swine. Don't cast what is holy to dogs. Meaning if somebody's asked you to stop, then stop. People say, no, I need to be persistent. In it. No, 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 you don't. What you do is you stop sharing the the gospel because they've asked you to. They've made their decision. They don't want to hear it from you. Then you pull back and you begin to launch long-range bombs at them through prayer. And so you're you're just changing your strategy, right? The face-to-face isn't working. So I'm going to pull back here. And when I pray, this is what it sounds like. Lord, you know that Joe, he just, he doesn't want me to share with him anymore. But Lord, I pray that you would bring Christians into his life every week, everywhere he turns. He can't turn on the radio and there's a program talking to Joe. And everywhere he goes, he's just like, and then I'll see him a couple months later. He goes, man, you know, I so appreciated you. You just pulled back. He said, but ever since we talked, it's the weirdest thing. These Christians are coming at me from Everywhere I go, it's a Christian. It's a, you know, the priest at the coffee shop. They're a Christian. They're, everywhere I go, and you just, you're just smiling because you're launching these long-range bomb, long bombs of prayer towards their life. But if you were to ask me to stop talking about the name of Jesus to everybody, that's not happening, right? Because Peter says, you judge whether it's right for me to obey God or man. 
when the governor of California said the church is not essential and you may not worship and you may not teach and you may not gather and you may not get together there's a point that after those first six weeks where we were trying to figure out the pandemic and now that we finally figured out it's just like the normal flu uh, can be an accelerant to people with bad health that are older we, we get that but every year that happens with flu season and pneumonia and various people and so once we figure that out like oh they're just trying to shut us down that the church is not essential so you judge whether it's right to obey God or man now I don't know if you know this or not, but this is continuing at Calvary Chapel of San Jose. I was just there a couple of weeks ago ministering to the team, preaching at their church, and they're still over $3 million in fines. They're in court, almost Zoom things like week after week. They're trying to crush them. They've, uh, the senior pastor has a personal fine against him. The assistant pastor has a personal fine against him. That wasn't working, so they brought in uh, OSHA, and they, they interviewed all of their teachers for their Christian school, and they fined them $68,000 for this fine, 15, 15, 15. But, and this is still happening up there. They will not relent. You judge, and, and, and they're trying to get, have Pastor Mike McClure up there give any concessions and they said okay you can meet together but you cannot sing it's, like, it's not happening the lord tells us to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs making melody in our hearts to the lord with one another yeah. right so there's no there, there's no there's a place that when the this is called civil disobedience when the government tells us to do something that's ungodly like when Pharaoh told the, the midwives to kill the male children of the uh, Israelites, the midwives said, we're not doing that. That's against God. Even though they, they were the, he was the authority of the land, and God blessed them and took care of their households because of it. So when the government tells me to do something that is against God, I'm not doing it. And when they tell me to stop doing something God's told me to do, like in Daniel's story, they, you know, for 30 days you can't pray to anybody but to the king. Daniel's like, well, that's not happened because three times a day he prayed to God. And as soon as he heard the law, he went home, opened his windows, looked towards Jerusalem and prayed. So if the government tells me I can't pray and tells me that I can't get together and sing with God's people, there's a place that we're not looking for a fight with the civil government. We're actually, as Christians, we're the best citizens in any place we ever will be. Because we are law-abiding citizens. We pay our taxes. We obey the laws. We're good to our neighbors. We're the best citizens that any country could possibly have until they try to take the place of God in our life. And we're not putting up with that. Right? That's the thing that people don't get. The progressive left, that is their religion. That's their religion. The religion is government. That's why they're, they're better at government than us. Why? Because that's what they're passionate about. That's their religion. They're zealous about it. Climate change. We're all going to die. New York and Los Angeles are going to be under 10 foot of water. And What's her name? Thurnberg? Greta. Yes. <laughs> people are going to burn up. I said, do you realize that there are people on the other side of that issue that says, yeah, things have increased one degree. We don't know whether that's good or bad. We have no idea. But the left uses it. You know, we'll be fortunate if they don't shut down another power plant in the state of California and you all get a little wind turbine for your own little hat <laughs> to keep each other cool because climate change is the religion of the left. Climate change and kill babies. This is what they're passionate about. Have you, any of you seen Will Witt's thing that he did for PragerU on the campus? He went around and he said, hey, would you sign this petition to save the baby eagle eggs? Oh, you the baby eagles. And every person he approached signed it. And he says, I have this other clipboard to, to save unborn children. And not one person would sign it. Let's save the baby eagle eggs. And let's kill the children. The Old Testament sacrificial systems... Sacrifice children. This is just wrapped in this progressive, this, you know, my, my body, my choice. So when we flipped that on about the vaccine, I'm like, my body, my choice. Oh, you can't use that. You can only use that when you want to kill another human being. It's irrational and illogical, but that's what we're up against. I want you guys, until you realize that the, the problem that we have in America 
is not political in nature, it's religious in nature because that is their religion. Government is the utopia. If we can all just have universal income, like if I could stay at home and play video games, the government owes me. You know, I should get, you know, like 1500 a month to do nothing because the government is God. We digress and go back to the Bible. So, <laughs> I apologize for my brief rant. I got lost just for a moment, and I, 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 I didn't mean to. It was not my... Most congregations should not give applause to their pastor's rant, but thank you very much. <laughs> but what I want to do is what the, the disciples in Acts chapter 4 did, and that was to pray for boldness. You've been threatened. Okay, shut up. Don't talk to anybody about Jesus. So, well, that's not working. I'm going to go get with my prayer team, and we're going to pray for more boldness. No, we're going we're gonna to get together, and we're going to move to Texas. <laughs> They're not going to go anywhere. They're not going to move anywhere. They're going to pray for boldness. They doubled down on boldness to talk about Jesus when the government told them to stop talking about Jesus. Isn't that something? Check it out. It says in verse 23, And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God, who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Now let me tell you, when you pray to God for anything, it's really good to remind yourself who you're talking to. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth, the land and the sea. How big is he? Because don't you guys feel like David and Goliath in this battle that we're in? Like Goliath is ginormous, especially around election cycles and what's going on. It's like, Goliath, but we're like David, but God, you're big. And so Remember that God made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, and this is not too big for him, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. David wrote this in Psalm 2. Isn't this exactly what's happened for the last two years? It says that the kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. What an incredible prayer. And at the end of the prayer, how does God say amen in the book of Acts? He shakes the place. <sighs> That's pretty cool, right? At the end of each prayer, wouldn't it be cool at the end of each sermon? It was just, <sighs> it's like the Lord saying, attaboy, way to go. In Acts chapter 16, when Paul and Silas, they're praying at midnight and they're singing psalms and stuff, and the Lord shook the place saying, amen, attaboy, way to go. And all the chains fell off the prisoners, and the doors opened up. One time I was preaching years ago, and there was a midst of a lightning storm, and I said this, you know, very forceful statement at the end of it. The lightning cracked across, the, you know, the roof of the, the house of the Lord. And the whole church went, ooh. <laughs> you wish you could plan that out, right? You could organize that each time. But what they prayed for was boldness. They prayed that God would give them boldness and the ability to heal people and help people and be a blessing so that they would have these opportunities to share about the love of Jesus. And I don't know if you need that prayer for boldness, but I know without Jesus and his spirit giving me courage and boldness, I'm a coward. I'm afraid. I'm timid. I'm bashful. I hold back. But when God fills me with power and I ask for his power and I have to get my first sentence out, I was working years ago in Las Vegas, and uh, I was working with this pretty rough-and-tumble crew. I'm a tile setter by trade, or marble, 
And so I was working on the, the second high rise of the F Flamingo Hilton in Las Vegas, and we were putting uh, marble in the t uh, tub splashes. And I was working with 10 to 15 guys, and they, I mean, construction guys are rough. And as soon as they found out, day one they found out I was a Christian because I told them, and they just, they razzed me and mocked me day in and day out the whole time I worked with them. Seven months, just every day. Oh, and they had all kinds of little names for me. Oh, here comes the Bible thumper. Okay, here comes Mr. Sunday School. Okay, here comes the little missionary. Oh, Billy Graham's here, guys. We're all good. Just day after day. And, you know, I just realized, hey, you know, I just got to take this. And at a church service there in Vegas where I was going, they had prayer for the Holy Spirit to give you boldness. And that's what I needed, right? I needed boldness. I'd already spoken up. I'd already, you know, shared my faith. But I went forward, and they laid hands on me, and they prayed for me for the Holy Spirit and gave me boldness. And from that day forward at work, God gave me a supernatural boldness at work. And it was that I really needed it because I was outnumbered. I mean, when you're one of 15, and you're the guy that everybody's dissing on, and it's, you know, it's, it's funny. They're all laughing at you. And you can take that. And I, I'm, I'm wired in such a way that I grew up with uh, pretty rough. So I'm like, whatever, bring it on. And, but the funny thing is, when any one of them, one of the guys who was a part of the crowd, always giving me a hard time, one day after work, he looks around, he's kind of hanging back, lingering, kind of staying close to the, in the parking lot by me, and, and all the other guys leave, and I, I go to get my rig, and he goes, hey, hey, Rick, and I'm like, what's up? He goes, you know, uh, my mom just got diagnosed with cancer, she, she got three months, you, you think you could pray for her? I said, sure, what's her name? I said, let's pray right now. He goes, oh, no, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. But, get, you know, you, you know God, man, right? Okay. <laughs> and off he went. And so I told him the next day, I said, hey, I prayed for your mom. He looked around to see if anybody heard. And he just joined in and started razzing me like everybody else day after day. After that, I, think I started realizing when they're in the, the crowd, it's kind of like a, a mob of dogs. Yeah, they're all big and tough, but actually when brokenness or bad things happen, they, they know who to go whisper to or to ask. One of the other guys, who I'd never really shared with personally, one day he burst into my, my uh, you know, you get into a hotel room, bathroom, and you're putting the marble up in the, the tub surround. So this guy burst in. Well, everywhere I went, I had my little Christian radio, and I'd, you know, from room to room, I got my Christian radio, and this guy burst in. He was just like, his face was red. He was so twerked off. And he goes, don't you think you're just taking this too far? And I was so startled. You know, if you're in a room and you're in your own little world, you're putting marble up on the wall and making sure it's straight, and, and somebody bursts in the room and, and says, don't you think it's too far? I mean, immediately I thought, well, no, the plans say the marble's supposed to go to here. I'm, th I'm thinking to myself, it's all about the, the marble. And, and he goes, no, and he sneers at the radio. He goes, no, you and this stupid Christian radio, everywhere you go, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Now, I had never shared with this guy one-on-one -on -one once in the months that I had been there. I don't know why he was so torqued off at me. Did, did you know just your mere presence of being a Christian close to ungodly people torques them off? Right? You didn't even have to say anything. Well, I learned it that day. He looked at me, and he said, once again, and I said, I said, oh, do you mean in my Christian life that I'm taking this too far? And he goes, yeah, that's what I mean. He said, I'm a good person. I said, I never said you weren't. I, I'd never talked to, honestly, I'd never spoken to the guy. Besides, you know, generally. And, and the Lord just filled me with his spirit. I could sense that boldness, you know, now speak. This is, this is the platform right now. And I said, do you think I can take this too far? I said, my Savior Jesus hung on a cross naked with spikes through his hands and his feet and a crown of thorns on his head. They plunged the spear into his side to make sure he was good and dead. They put him in a tomb, but death couldn't hold him. Three days later, he rose from the dead. And are you telling me if I'm walking around with a little Christian radio and loving Jesus, I could, do you think I can take this thing too far? Do you think he took it too far to save my soul? And if he hung naked on a cross, the least I can do is share my love for him. I'm fully clothed. There's no spikes through my hands or feet. And he was dumbfounded. And he just turned on his heel and just walked out of the room. And he never spoke to me ever again for the, the remaining months that I worked there. You don't always know what's going to happen in the exchange. And 
I was never looking for an opportunity to offend somebody. I'm never looking for an opportunity to be rejected because I think everybody wants to be loved. Everybody wants to be accepted. Everybody wants to be a part of the group. But you also need the backbone when your faith in Jesus puts you on the outs that you're okay with that. Because as long as I'm on the outs and I'm going through that trial and that tribulation, I sense Jesus closer to me than ever. Like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, when they were thrown into the fiery furnace, and Nebuchadnezzar looked in there and he said, didn't we put three guys in there? And they said, yes, king. He said, but the fourth one's in there and he looks like the son of God. Do you see, when you're in the fire of tribulation and everybody else is hating on you, Jesus enters the furnace of your own trial and he's closer in fellowship with you than you're ever gonna experience in your entire life. So much so that the king had to call the three out because I think when they were in there and they sensed the intimacy with Jesus in the trial, they thought to themselves, it's better to be in this fiery furnace and this close to God than to be on the outside and less close to God. The reality is, is that these disciples are praying for boldness. They're praying for God to give them the ability to have the freedom of speech to open up their heart to their loved ones. I, I have people that I know, they've lost their best friends. They've lost their parents in the sense that the parents said, you know, I never, I never want to have anything. My son's dead to me. And it can be a lonely place. And Jesus said, he said, you know what? You got to count the cost. You got to count the cost of following me because it's not for the faint of heart. The Christian life is the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. As a matter of fact, if Jesus would have told me how hard it is when I signed up, I may not have signed up. You know what I mean? It's the same thing in ministry. When the Lord called me into the ministry, I had no idea how hard it was gonna be. And if I did know, I may not have signed up. So it's good that the Lord keeps you naive enough to make you get down the road far enough that there's no turning back. Because I got down the road far enough and I looked and I said, hey, I didn't know it was gonna be this hard. And I look, yeah, oh well, I'm a long down, ways down the road now. Might as well, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound. I wanna encourage some of you. I know through the last couple of years, you've really suffered. You've made a stand. Or you've posted something on your Facebook page or your Twitter or Instagram and the haters came out of the woodwork and you realized for the first time, wow, maybe these people weren't my friend. And the thing that many of us have discovered in the last couple of years is that we lost a lot of relationships, but the ones we gained back are mucho better. Because the people are the same kind of people that we can pray together for boldness. Amen? Amen. 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 Hey, we're going to turn our hearts to communion. So grab your communion. We're going to have the worship team come. We're going to start with our bread. That last night that Jesus was his, with his disciples, he took the bread, he broke it, and he blessed it. And he said, take heat, this is my body that's given for you. Jesus' body was brutalized in my place. He took, he's my substitute, he's your substitute, and what they did to his body. And when we get to hold these elements, this is the most beautiful thing about what Jesus has given us. He's actually given us physical elements that remind us of his body and his blood that was shed for us in communion. So this is the longest running family meal in world history, 2,000 years. And we get to remember him. And I'm so thankful for something in my hands to tangibly remember Jesus' body that was given for me. Lord Jesus, thank you for giving your body for us. Thank you for taking our place. Thank you for surrendering your will to the unspeakable suffering that we might be forgiven. Thank you, Lord, for your body. Let's take the bread together. And as we take the cup, the color of his blood that was shed, that's the purpose of it. His blood was shed to wash away our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, to make us, as it says in 
1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse us, forgive us of our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, to make us who are bright red with sin as white as snow with his life that was poured out for us. Jesus, thank you for your blood that was poured out for us that we might be a forgiven people. Lord, cleanse your people, those who feel condemned, those who feel guilt or shame. Lord, that you paid the price for all of this so that you will wash away our guilt, wash away our shame, wash away our condemnation because you, Lord Jesus, paid the price. Thank you for your blood that was shed. Let's take the cup together. Let's stand together. I want you to know after this closing song, the prayer team's gonna be down in front. They'd love to pray for you, minister to you, in any way that you need. Don't leave without having prayer and encouragement. May the Lord keep you in his grace and walk with him and pray for his spirit to give you the courage and the boldness with the opportunities he gives you this week. Let's worship the king with this closing song. See the light in the darkness I won't hope for the hopeless And rest for the weary mind and you've got truth for the taking, but my heart won't be shaken if today be the day that I die. Whoa, 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 whoa. And I won't worry about tomorrow or fear in times of trouble. I keep my heart seeking. I will keep my heart seeking you. Whoa, oh, 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 oh, whoa, 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 I will keep my heart seeking.